Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey was so pissed off that he actually jumped up and spoke out of turn because he was so offended by what he heard coming out of the mouth of one of the three black U.S. senators. This is how Booker responded to Scott. Madam President. The senator from New Jersey. I have deep and, and, and a, a tremendous respect for my friend uh, from South Carolina. I'm not a senator from the South, but my family hails from the South, from Monroe, Louisiana, to Alabama, to North Carolina. I know my roots and I know the challenges of Jim Crow and thank God we are not in a time of Jim Crow. The history that my friend talked to, I know I know this history and I know my colleagues in the Senate know this history. We're all not blind to what happened in terms of racial oppression going back to the founding of this nation. The Constitution that people have been waving around, it's hard not to read that and not see that many of the compromises were based upon an acquiescence to that original sin of this nation, than slavery. We know the violence of he, what he said and talked about. I, I'm frustrated that we can agree that there has been overwrought language on both sides of the political aisle around this issue, but we should be focusing on the facts. I have a hard time listening to people that want to talk about this issue and don't talk about facts. In the United States today, it is more difficult for the average African American to vote than the average white American. That is not rhetoric, that is fact. We know that black voters on average are forced to wait online twice as long as white voters. We began this session today swearing an oath to that flag, saying that this would be a nation of liberty and justice for all. Where is the justice in a nation that there is on average for a black person twice as long to vote? It, it's, it's factual, but let's, let's keep going because I heard my colleague Speak. During the 2016 presidential election, residents of entirely black neighborhoods waited to vote. They were 74% more likely to spend more than 30 minutes at their polling place relative to residents of entirely white neighborhoods. That's a fact. Similar racial disparities were observed right before the pandemic. In the 2018 midterm elections, a Brennan Center report found that Latino voters waited almost 46% longer than white voters and black white voters about 45%. The report also found that Latino and black voters were more likely than white voters to wait in the longest of lines on election day. You could go into state after state and you will see who waits factually on longer lines? Georgia. Are we going to reduce this to just being about water? I find that law offensive, but that's not the thing that offends me most. You want to know what's going on in Georgia right now? They have a historical pattern of dwindling polling places in the diverse areas with some voters in Georgia waiting up to 10 hours in predominantly black neighborhoods. Think about this for a second. You wanna talk about voter suppression? You're working a job? You're taking care of young kids? And you're gonna give up a day's salary in Georgia to vote? You wanna talk about a modern day poll tax? And my friends on the other side are saying that race is not an issue here? I'm gonna continue with facts because I was flabbergasted that someone could stand up here and say there's not a different experience 
for blacks and whites from voting. I'm just going to continue to read the facts. Since Shelby V. Holder that eviscerated the Voting Rights Act that people like Goodman, Cheney, and Schwarner died for, black voters in Georgia have faced disproportionately longer lines and fewer polling places. The average number of voters per polling place have grown 40% in diverse Atlanta metro since 2012, and voters in black neighborhoods waited nearly 10 times as long on average after polling places were closed in neighborhoods. I'm looking for amen from my, my, from my colleague from Georgia. I mean, in what country are we where a certain minority in predominantly minority communities has to wait 10 times as long? And so when you read, and I've heard my colleagues read these laws, they read, well, what's wrong with having no drop boxes because, hey, we didn't have them before the pandemic. What's wrong with, with uh, not having that many days uh, to vote by mail? What's wrong with these things is obvious because they're not designed for voter protection. They're not designed to help voters have more access to the polls. They are designed to suppress the vote and create these longer lines. That is the obvious result. And if you can't see that, I, I, I'm flabbergasted. I'm sorry. It's hard. This is not my turn to speak and forgive me to my colleagues, but I am flabbergasted that the Republican Party, the party of the 14th Amendment, the party that once fought for equal access to the polls is now creating this ruse that every 19 states, that the states that are passing these laws, 19 states, this is not about voter protection. Donald Trump's own person said this, the last election was the safest, most secure election in American history. This is not about in-person voter fraud. Study after study has shown that you're more likely to be struck by lightning. <laughs> this is about lies. I'm sorry, this is about lies and they're targeting groups. I'm gonna go on with the facts, but I just wanna talk about students for a second. I heard my Senator John Tester I, I've heard my colleagues from New Hampshire, I, I, and they're not hiding the ball, folks. They're, they're, not, they're not trying to tell us, oh, we're concerned about it. As early as 2011, state Republican House Speaker at the time in New Hampshire, Senators, you know William O'Brien? Can I get a hallelujah there? <laughs> promised to clamp down on unrestricted votings by students, calling them kids voting liberal, Whoa. voting their feelings with no life experience. I hear what you're saying that this is, a, 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 oh, these laws are innocuous on their face. But if you start looking at the legislative record, you see groups are being targeted in this country. Polling places are diminishing on college campuses. Voter IDs laws are being created so complex in Midwestern states that they're saying you, you can't use a four-year ID. It's got to be a two-year ID. That's some of the laws that are being passed. Can somebody be a witness on that? And, and I hear this rhetoric where people pull out one law. Well, look at this law. This is just about shrinking the days, or this is so innocuous on its face. And I know there are people at home thinking to myself, hey, that doesn't sound like a big deal. Maybe Republicans have a point. No, let's return to the facts. I'm going to go to Texas, because I heard the senator from Texas accuse this body of creating rhetoric that was divisive. You wanna know what's divisive to a country that's, that says e pluribus unum, above where the presiding person is? You don't wanna know what's divisive? 
is telling people in the congresswoman's state that if you live in a predominantly minority area, we're going to remove polling places and change laws so that black folks disproportionately are waiting 5, 10, 15 times longer. He just completely destroyed Tim Scott. I mean, destroyed Tim Scott and Republicans and brought out all of the CVS long receipts. to And, and, ben, and I appreciate him using the word lie. By him saying they are lying, not misstating, not misinforming. He said Republicans are lying. Go back to Booker. Facts. The burden of long lines in polling places, closures in Texas, in the post-Shelby County area, often falls disproportionately on black and Latino voters. Congresswoman, of the approximately 750 sites Texas has closed since Shelby v. Holder, 542 were in the 50 counties with the fastest growing black and Latino populations. Don't lecture me about Jim Crow. I know this is not 1965. That's what makes me so outraged. It's 2022. Okay, right there, he was talking to Tim Scott. Press play. And they're blatantly removing more polling places from the counties where black and Latinos are overrepresented. I'm not making that up. That is a fact. I I'm not going to stop because I'm tired of hearing that this does not have to do about singling out certain populations in our country, students, Native Americans, and, and not others. I'm not accusing anybody. Please, let's not throw around the defense where we crouch into defensive postures. I'm not accusing anybody of being racist. I'm just speaking to the facts in our country that I know motivate everybody here. A hundred of my, 99 of my colleagues know it is wrong to create barriers for some populations and not others under the guise of a lie that there's a voter security problem. Let me continue. I, I'm sorry, Congresswoman, to keep talking about Texas. In the presidential primary on March 3rd, voters at the historically black Texas Southern University in Houston waited not an hour, not two hours, not three, four, five, waited six hours. At a poll of Texas voters conducted just in 2020 election underscored the disparity of non-white voters facing casting their ballots. I'm sorry, Senator Kane, you were very good when you talked about that sign of 98% of people happy. I sat here stunned. I, I was wondering who they were polling because they were not polling black and Latino voters in Texas when they, when they did that. Let me give you the facts. 48% of black voters and 55% of Latino voters in Texas found it easy to vote. But that leaves a lot of folks that didn't think it was easy. White voters, actually 65% think it's easy to vote. Everybody's not happy. People who wait in six hour lines are not happy. I just want to give a couple more facts. Let's go to my dad's home state. North Carolina was one of the states most affected by poll closures. There were 158 fewer polling places in 40 counties with large black communities. And African American voter participation dropped 16%. Why? Well, my friend Bennett said this. We still live in a country where the economic disparities between blacks and whites are, is what it was in the 1960s. 
And so if you're a black struggling family and your option to vote means standing in line for 10 hours compared to predominantly white counties where the wait is longer, you don't go vote. And that's not just black folks. The stories about disabled voters with about one in seven or one in eight pointing out that it's hard for them to vote because of physical impediments, that's discriminatory against them. It doesn't mean people here are anti-disabled. We're not throwing those labels around. I'm just talking about the facts. And, and, and so I, I just want my colleagues to know that I, I, can't, I, I, I can pull story after story of these states, the 19 that are passing these laws, if you pull them out and want to read them up absent context, you're going to try to obscure the larger picture that's going on in our nation is that we are seeing entirely Republican legislatures, entirely Republican legislatures passing laws that are disproportionately impacting certain groups by the facts. And so I, I want to close with this because I love what, on the, on the march across the Edmund Pettit Bridge, they were stopped, beaten back. They tried to go again with King, again blocked by Alabama state troopers, but they finally got to their destination to protest voting rights. And I love what King said there. He, he talked about those people whose hearts were discouraged because we, they hadn't passed voting rights. And I know there's going to be a lot of people in this day that are going to feel that kind of discouragement. But... Reverend Warnock, King gave one of his best speeches that day where he asked people, how long are we going to have to wait? Not long. Because the truth, I'm thinking about the lies we're hearing now, the big lies, the lies of in-person voting, where the truth crushed to the earth will rise again. Don't, don't, don't lie and say there's not a disparate voting reality for blacks and whites in this country right now. The facts speak differently. Don't lie and say that these laws are not being done in a way to make it harder for students to vote. Don't lie and say that we are a nation that should be doing more to ease access as opposed to putting up more barriers because to go on more barriers is anti-democratic. Those lies will not live forever. I do believe still that the arc of the moral universe is long and it bends till justice. I still believe that the best of our democracy will come out if people do not give up and are not discouraged. I ask my colleagues right now to continue on the floor today, to continue to tell the truth of what's happening in your states, to continue telling the truth of what's happening in our nation. Because we will win this fight. I don't know how long it will take, but that will be determined by how dedicated we are to the principles of this democracy. We must live in a nation where everyone is equal, not in rhetoric or in slogan or in salutes, but everyone is equal in the experience they have through participating in democracy. The vote is the bedrock of our nation, is the foundation of the country, and it does have cracks that need our repair. Whether we get down on our knees in prayer or we stand tall, let's continue the work of this democracy so that freedom and justice does roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Uh, forgive my me colleagues for, for speaking well beyond my time, and I apologize if I demonstrated too much emotion. All right, folks, back to that my unfiltered video in just one moment.
Folks, Black Star Network is here. A real um, revolutionary right now. <laughs> Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roland. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black Owned Media and something like CNN. You can't be Black Owned Media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?